passe. Oh là 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 là, là attendez, attendez. De, ne donnez pas tout. S'il vous plaît, accueillez comme il se doit, messieurs, dames, Mr. H. Wood. Let's go Fais du bruit, allez Merci. Merci beaucoup, je vous l'ai dit. Ah oui, allez, allez Et s'il vous plaît, un tonnerre d'applaudissements pour mon ami, la traductrice qui va faire tous les chants aussi. Eh bien écoutez, on peut s'asseoir, allons-y, on va s'asseoir. Je vous l'ai dit, je vous ai annoncé il y a quelques instants, c'est vous qui allez faire vivre cette conférence. Vous n'hésitez surtout pas, je suis sûr qu'il y a beaucoup de questions, n'est-ce pas Voilà, qui a une question On va commencer les hostilités, réellement. La première, the first question for you. Attention, je vois que tu as une question. Let's go, viens à moi. Ah, on a, on a le petit micro, c'est parti alors. Hello, Nigel. Hello. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, my question is very simple. What was the hardest scene to shoot during your famous trilogy, The King of the Jewel? <laughs> the King of the Jewel. The King of the Jewel. Uh, the Jewel. Yeah. Um... And, and, and uh, second question. Yeah. During your career, what was your worst experience with an actor? Uh -huh. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, to your first question first. Um, no one will know. The um, I don't know. I think that the, the most complicated scene in that walking film that we made in New Zealand uh, was probably when my character was on the side of the mountain, kind of you know having been completely overtaken and ceased to really be himself anymore. Just you know, getting that right emotionally, physically. That you know, there was a there's a lot riding on that. It's such an important part of the end of that character's journey for that to be palpable and and for you you as an audience to really feel what he's lost and and what he's going through in that moment. So that I just remember feeling a great deal of. Pressure, you know, un understandably, to get to make sure I got that right. Um, and for both Sean Aston and I, because obviously that was really the two of us on that journey for for a, a bulk of it. That was that was equally important for him as well. And I remember that day and kind of how we felt after the end of that day, feeling like I think we I think we did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was probably where I put the most amount of pressure on myself as an actor just to get that, because it really is the end of this journey. Oh, and um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, look, I worked with all kinds of people. I, I have, I've been so fortunate to be doing this for such a long time. I started when I was eight years old. I'm going to be 43 next year. It's fucking insane. Um, and I've worked with so many extraordinary people. I, I really genuinely only have great stories to tell. There have been a couple along the way that were less favorable than others, but I would never say it's... My, my, my style is always to um, articulate only positive things and not spread negativity. So, I, look, yeah, I've certainly worked with people that were, were, uh, uh, weren't as easy as others, but most of the time, I would say 98% of the time or more, I, I've worked with incredibly lovely people. And I've only ever really heard mostly, uh, you know, horrible stories from other people. I, my, my experiences don't necessarily reflect that. Shit, do you have to translate all that? Fuck! I did the thing that I said I wasn't gonna do! I'm sorry. I'm going to be a little more rapid than him, because I know we don't have a lot of time. The first question was, what was the most difficult to film in this trilogy where they do a rando with a bijou? And if you remember well, at the end, he climbs on the side of the mountain with his friend, and it's a moment that is full of emotions for his personage because he has lost a little bit. He's not himself. He's been completely surpassed by the bijou, and for him, there was a lot of pressure as an actor 
pour faire justice à ce personnage et à ses émotions et avec le public. Et donc avec l'autre acteur qui, qui joue son ami, ils avaient énormément de pression et il se souvient encore du sentiment qu'ils avaient après avoir filmé ces scènes-là, de se dire « bon bah j'espère qu'on qu y a vraiment rendu justice ». Et on lui a demandé quelle était sa pire expérience avec un collègue, avec un autre acteur. Et il a énormément de chance, il fait ce travail depuis ses 8 ans et il a eu malgré ça que de bonnes expériences. Il a entendu des mauvaises choses de la part d'autres personnes, mais lui il a travaillé avec des gens super. Et s'il y a eu des moments un peu moins bien, il ne veut pas s'attarder dessus. On peut l'applaudir, madame. Alors... Est-ce qu'on a d'autres questions Je vous sens un petit peu timide, là, quand même. La Paris, vous êtes là ou pas Ah, quand même Alors, on va prendre d'autres questions. Eh bien, où est le micro C'est toi qui as un micro Alors, j'ai des questions qui sont là-bas, mais c'est difficile pour toi. Ça va être difficile de jouer une dame là-bas, là. Il va falloir que tu passes un petit peu. Ah. Je vois qu'elle est contente. Et Souman est very happy. Bonjour. Bonjour. Et merci beaucoup d'être venu ici. Ça me fait vraiment très très plaisir. Je suis surexcitée. <rire> euh, ma question est, quand vous êtes arrivé devant cette jolie petite maison en Nouvelle-Zélande avec la porte ronde, quel était votre sentiment Moi personnellement, c'est ma scène préférée. Mais voilà, j'aimerais votre sentiment à vous. Well, it, it, two things. One, just getting to New Zealand and being introduced to the beauty of that country was extraordinary. It was also, for me, the, the first time that I had ever been away from home, or that I, when I first got there, that I knew that I was going to be away from home for the, the longest I'd ever been away from home. I was 18 at the time. So the significance of that, of, of landing in that country and kind of thinking, okay, I'm about to begin this really extraordinary journey unlike anything I've been on. And then, yeah, the, the sets and the kind of creation of that world was beyond anything I'd ever experienced. And, and um, the, the, home, the home, I'm trying to speak around it, but the, the home with the round doors, um, it, it was as, uh, it was as it, exactly as I'd imagined it to be. Um, it felt, I also remember feeling it felt very cozy and comfortable. There's something about the rounded edges and the, the sort of tunnel-like halls that felt very cozy and, and it felt like home. You kind of wanted to spend time in that space. And it felt real. I think the thing that to impart to all of you for, for what we were going through was We were working in these environments that came to life for us. We didn't have to do a lot of imagining. Obviously, there, weren't, there wasn't a cave troll. Um, the Balrog wasn't there. But beyond that, we didn't have to imagine a lot because the environment that we were, we were in was so realistic and, and really transportive um, and amazing. Thank you. Alors sa première impression de la maison avec la porte ronde, bah, d'abord c'était son arrivée en Nouvelle-Zélande parce qu'il savait que c'était la première fois de sa vie qu'il allait être très loin de chez lui pendant aussi longtemps, il avait seulement 18 ans donc il a été très impressionné par ce pays qui, qui l'accueillait et il nous a dit trois choses sur son impression de cette maison d'abord c'était comme il l'avait imaginé, c'était très beau, c'était vraiment comme dans les livres euh, c'était cosy, c'était confortable, ils avaient vraiment envie d'y être et d'y passer du temps. Euh, et puis ça rendait la, leur travail beaucoup plus facile parce qu'ils n'ont pas, pas eu à utiliser beaucoup leur imagination en fait. Tellement euh, le monde était bien recréé et ça leur donnait toutes les impressions dont ils avaient besoin pour jouer. Même s'il n'y avait pas certaines créatures comme un troll des cavernes, euh, mais les, les plateaux et la façon dont ils ont été construits les ont vraiment aidés à faire leur travail. And one thing to add to that. The, the experience of going to, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk around it, but the experience of, of seeing our hometown built into the, the, the hillsides of, of the farmland of New Zealand, seeing that for the first time with the tree above the house and these incredible 
homes built into the hills. It, it was as if it had always been there. It was so magical, and, and, and just as magical as it might be for you to visit it now, because you can go to New Zealand and see that for real, it was just as magical for us. You know, we'd crossed a hill and suddenly there, there was this land, this homeland for these characters that looked like it had been there forever, and it, it, it was really incredible for us. Et c'était absolument magique la première fois de découvrir au détour d'un chemin toute la ville où son personnage vit, donc on n'a pas le droit de dire le nom, mais avec toutes les maisons dans les collines, les arbres au-dessus des maisons et tout ça, que c'est vraiment, euh, ouais, c'est comme d'arriver dans un autre monde et que c'était un sentiment magique et c'est toujours là-bas, donc si vous allez en Nouvelle-Zélande, vous pouvez le visiter et si vous avez ce sentiment de magie en arrivant, bah, sachez que c'est la même chose qu'ils ont ressenti. Merci beaucoup, on peut l'applaudir. Hein moi j'ai une question. Une question. Oui. Il a tourné dans une adaptation d'une bande dessinée de Frank Miller. Est-ce que, est-ce qu'il a eu une préparation pour ce rôle qui est quand même aux antipodes de ses autres rôles Et est-ce qu'il connaissait l'œuvre de Frank Miller avant de tourner dans cette adaptation Yes, I was familiar with the with the graphic novel, um, and weirdly, I had I had just read through all of the books, and in time for um, Robert Rodriguez to come to Los Angeles, he was coming through town. I'd worked with Robert Rodriguez on another film many years prior, um, where an alien invasion takes over a high school. I'm sure many of you have seen it, um, and. He was just coming to town. So I had just happened to read them. I had no idea that he was planning on an adaptation. And over dinner, he mentions that he's working on an adaptation. I was like, that's wild, because I, I just read this and thought it would be amazing for someone to do this. And in my mind, it made more sense for it to be animated, just because you could more closely adapt this very specific work of Frank Miller's penmanship. Like that, That, those drawings are so iconic to the, to the graphic novels. Anyway, long story short, um, I, 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 I did audition. He, he had auditions for the, the role, and, and um, I, I just went to a hotel room where he was doing the auditions at this hotel in Los Angeles. And because there's no dialogue for my character, I just sat staring at the camera with glasses as he read, read passages from the, the graphic novel. That was my audition. Um, there was no real preparation. Uh, obviously, there's no dialogue. There wasn't enough time to do any physical preparation, because if there was going to be anything, it would have been sort of fight training, I suppose, because it's, it's a very physical role. We shot all of my sequences in two days. Because there's no, there's no locations, there's no sets, it's all against blue screen or green screen. Um, Mickey Rourke had already finished his work, so I was working with Mickey Rourke's stunt double. And it was all little pieces, and the thing is, is the, the graphic novel was our storyboard. You know, every shot that we would render in film was just a reference to what was previous. So, we, you know, he, Robert would just show me, like, this is the panel we're shooting right now, and I would know, what, understand what we were doing. So the, the prep was knowing the work, I think, more than anything, like knowing the graphic novel, understanding the character, and then on the day, it just sort of reacting to what physicality I had. I mean, there was some wire work, it was, you know, hung up on wires with kicks, and I remember hurting my back a little bit. <laughs> But yeah, just two days, there was not a whole lot of prep, it was just kind of in and out. But so much fun, and, and you know, delicious to work with a character that is so evil and uh, doesn't say anything, and it kind of seems to garner some enjoyment by being eaten by dogs. Right? Again, I'm sorry. No, no. Donc, il nous parle de son expérience sur ce film qui est adapté d'une bande dessinée de Frank Miller, et la façon dont il a eu son rôle. En fait, il venait tout juste de lire les livres. Et le réalisateur du film est, était venu le voir parce qu'ils avaient travaillé ensemble sur un autre film avec des aliens qui envahissent une école, vous l'avez peut-être vu. Euh, et donc il lui a expliqué qu'il allait tourner ça. Et il dit bah « Alors, c'est drôle, je viens de les lire. 
et il ne nous raconte que pour son audition, comme son personnage ne parle pas, il est juste resté assis à regarder la caméra avec des lunettes et euh, c'est comme ça qu'il a, qu a eu le rôle. Et en termes de préparation, ben, il n'a pas eu beaucoup de temps pour se préparer parce qu'ils ont filmé toutes ces scènes en deux jours et que l'acteur principal avait déjà fini, donc il jouait même avec sa doublure. S'il avait eu le temps, il aurait voulu euh, se préparer physiquement un peu pour les cascades. Parce qu'il y, y a beaucoup de combats, euh, il s'est fait un peu même mal au dos en, en faisant ses, ses cascades et ce combat, mais que c'était une super expérience. Et ils avaient la BD en fait pour se guider, donc ils lui montraient juste, voilà aujourd'hui on filme ce panneau de la bande dessinée, et puis euh, c'est parti, euh, c'est parti, on le fait. Et son résumé de cette expérience, c'est que c'était vraiment génial de jouer un personnage qui est aussi mauvais et qui prend du plaisir à, à être méchant et à même à se faire dévorer par des chiens. One thing to add to that too is um, when I had dinner with Robert, and again, this was prior to him getting greenlit for the film, he was like, he, he mentioned that he was going to do an adaptation of, of these graphic novels, and then he was like, actually, I have a, I have a promo in, the, in my car on my computer if you want to watch. I'm like, wait, what? So what he had done is he had shot that first sequence with Josh Hartnett on the, on the um, veranda at the top of that building. He had shot that as a proof of concept to, to basically prove to Frank Miller that he could adapt the work and have it look like the comic, as well as kind of get the sort of funding for the, the feature film by saying, this is it, this is, this is how the movie's gonna look. And so I went to his car and, and he opened his laptop and showed me that opening sequence and I was absolutely blown away because, in, again, my brain was imagining the only way to do this would be to animate it, you know? The work is so specific to the comic and the drawings in the comic. And what he had done is, is brought that to life in a way that felt so, so similar to what Frank Miller's drawings were. And so I saw that months before we started shooting because he shot that little piece over a couple of days. It's pretty amazing. Et il nous raconte toujours sur ce film qu'il était super impressionné par la façon dont ça a été filmé pour ressembler à une BD. Parce que lui, il pensait, en ayant lu le, les BD, qu'il fallait que ce soit un dessin animé, en fait, pour respecter le style de Frank Miller. Et le réalisateur lui a montré euh, sur son ordi dans sa voiture qu'il avait tourné la séquence d'ouverture du film avec Josh Hartnett sur le toit, pour ceux qui l'ont vu, euh, pour euh, prouver à Frank Miller qu'il était capable d'adapter sa bande dessinée avec un style visuel qui correspondait et pour l'aider à obtenir les financements pour le film. Et c'est en voyant ça, en fait, qu'il a été complètement bluffé que, que le style pouvait être aussi bien respecté. Alors, on, hey, non, c'est tout. Allez, là, faites-vous plaisir, les gars. Faites-vous plaisir, quand même. S'il vous plaît. S'il vous plaît. Merci. Bon, c'est bon. bon. On va prendre une question de ce côté. Je t'ai passé de ce côté-là. Une question ici. Alors... Je regarde, vous me regardez tous avec des yeux, mais genre, c'est difficile. It's too difficult for me to choose. And now it's hard. Yeah. Ah, là. Allez, Miss, là-bas, toi. Aïe, 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 Comment tu t'appelles Ben bah, oui, non, l'autre là-bas, là. Nayan, Nayan. Nayan, Nayan, ta question. Yeah, so hi, thank hi. you so much for being here. Yeah. Uh, so I have two questions. The first one is, do you still meet with the cast of the King of the Jewels? <laughs> And the second question is, could you tell us an anecdote of what happened, I don't know, backstage, a very funny story that happened that you remember very clearly? Again, in the King. Talk. Okay, yeah, right, sure. Um, Yes, we, we, I'm still very close with, well look, we, we, all of us are kind of linked forever, right? Having, having made those films, it's that kind of thing that even if some time goes by without having seen each other, when you do see those people again, it could be a year, two years later, it's as if no time has passed. So, I haven't seen Vigo, for instance, in maybe four years, but... It, I, it, the next time I were to see him, it would be like no time has passed. We're, we're, we're linked. And so some of us see each other more regularly, like the, the, the four short characters. <laughs> um, we, we have a, th a, a thread, a, a text thread that we communicate every day. 
um, and most of it is sharing our crossword time. So we're, we, we play the, the New York Times mini crossword and, and we share like how our times for completion. Um, so yeah, we, we text each other every day. But you know, the, the cast is, we're all linked for the rest of our lives um, in, the, in the best way. Um, it, it, at this point it's like family, you know. Do you want to translate that part? Right? Uh, Est-ce qu'il est toujours en contact avec ses collègues avec qui il a fait cette randonnée euh, avec le bijou Oui. Euh, et ils sont liés pour la vie, ils sont tous amis. Et même s'ils ne se voient pas parfois pendant quelques années, quand ils se voient, c'est comme s'il n'y avait aucun temps qui s'était écoulé depuis la dernière fois. Et pour euh, ceux qui jouaient avec lui, les quatre personnages un peu petits avec les pieds poilus, si vous voyez de qui je parle, ils ont un, ils ont un groupe euh, où ils se parlent tous les jours. Et surtout, ils se partagent leur, leur temps pour faire les mots croisés, pour voir qui est le plus rapide. So, there, yeah, funny question, anecdote, I mean, funny uh, story, anecdote on the set. Um, there's lots. The first thing that comes to mind is I think day one, actually, it's either day one or day two, I think it was day one. Um, The four of us are falling down a hill and land on the road. On like the second or third take, we do that. I, I, we fall and I fall and they fall on top of me and I farted. And it was just very funny. Uh, I, you know, it's four dudes that find that kind of thing hilarious, and that was very funny. And it was very funny that it was literally like the second or third shot that we shot for the movie. Um, I'll never forget that. But also another funny thing is that the, they, they would, they would um, the other two, Billy and Dom, would get me about things a lot, like they, they had invented a game called Tig, That wasn't a game, but they, they described this game to me in such detail that I believed it was real for like a couple of years to where it wasn't revealed until many years later that it was a joke. But they kept, every time I felt like I was understanding the rules of the game, they would add and introduce new rules. Um, I'm very gullible as it turns out. Euh, et alors des anecdotes rigolotes de tournage, il y en a deux. La première, c'était le jour de, soit leur premier jour, soit leur deuxième jour, ils se rappellent plus, mais les quatre personnages en question, ils tombent euh, le long d'une colline et ils atterrissent sur la route. Et pendant l'une des prises, il est tombé par terre, les autres sont tombés sur lui et il a pété. Et donc euh, c'était quatre mecs en train de rigoler pour euh, ce genre d'humour et ils s'en rappellent toujours. Ça l'a eu beaucoup fait rire. Euh, et sinon, euh, les, les deux autres. Euh, collègues qui, qui étaient dans cette scène, ils ont inventé, ils se moquaient beaucoup de lui et en fait comme ils croient facilement ce qu'on lui dit, ils avaient inventé un jeu qui n'existe pas, ils lui avaient expliqué toutes les règles très compliquées et en fait il y a cru pendant trois ans jusqu'à ce qu'il apprenne que c'était une blague et à chaque fois qu'il croyait comprendre les règles, il rajoutait une règle.